Shark is in the water. Are we clear to cut her loose? Yep, clear. All clear. Five don't move the bypass. I don't have a picture out of uh, Atalanta Zeus yet. Oh, you want Atalanta uh, HD cam? Yeah, I think it's on though. What, uh, and where is that? Hotel. I, it, oh, there you go. Cameras, yeah. tilt, yeah, yeah. HD cams on. Perfect, thank you. Ooh, nice place there. Awesome. I'm all good. Can you turn on that other camera that doesn't get turned on with oh, yeah, yeah. its uh, starboard with the salvo macro? Thank you. Starboard rail is on. Atalanta's in the water. All right. Copy. Atalanta in the water. Descending. I'm going to zero tether wraps and six eight wraps. Squid, lots of squid. Wraps are zeroed. Is it util? Util. Thank you. Good there. Hold on our sensor. Recording. Sensors. Seeking. It's an audio slate for dive hotel 2009 UTC time 1404. Two, three. Mark.
We go to a dive salvo. All right. Gauges look good. Van Winch. Van Winch. Did you guys hear that radio call? Go ahead, radio. Winch. I'll stop five zero meters. Are you ready for control? Ready. For control. Ready to give it a bump, Tito? And what are we bumping? You've got it. Winch. winch. Testing the winch. Thank you. I have control of the winch. Right. I'm ready to start down. Yep. Control van has control. The port camera looks pretty good. Yeah, it's a, a little, little overexposed. Blown out, but yeah. yeah. Never gonna win an Emmy if you don't have shallow depth of field. No. All right, headed down. Like uh, two five four zero or something. Seems like we've been going to this at 2295. 90 minutes to bottom. Seems like we've been going to the darn near the same depth every dive. Uh, bop, bop. Let's see if we're recording files. That'd be an added bonus. Look at that, files. <laughs> Sensors all look good. All right. Who wants to do a system health check? I do. Estimated depth is 2295.
Yep, take two. Five minutes. Five minutes, that's a fast descent. Set one, set two, set three. Cord one, two, three, four, five. Check. Salvos are good. Air is good. One hour timer. All right. Okay, got the still camera set up for this dive test. Well done. There you go. So, um, Tori has asked me to notify you all that she will currently be in a ship to shore for the beginning of this dive. So Confirmed, I see her behind me. Yes, so I'm not sure if one of you guys has a question to get us all started, or... Oh. Oh, I'm not good at coming up with those. You're not, you're not, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Malia, yeah. you're muted. No, <laughs> she's not. I hear her. Oh, uh, I don't hear her. I don't hear her. Oh. Maybe I just hear her because she's near me. <laughs> Are you talking to SPL? The white bar under it? Goddamn. And it check it real quick. I'll be right there. Yes, it's on. Ready to start. Both heads. Okay, thank you. Oh, I can hear well, you Hello, now. Ed. What's that? I was plugged into the wrong one. Uh, you know, that was <laughs> I was going to suggest, I was like, nah, she didn't do that again. It's very early in the morning. <laughs> hey, that's the first time I did that. <laughs> oh, so, oh, yeah, someone else did that when they relieved you. That's what that's what it was. I didn't, I didn't realize there were two of them over there. I do that all the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so um, a good po potential question is, what is it that you're craving that you yeah, want like to that. eat when you get back to shore? Yeah, I like it. Oh, do you want to start? Okay, I'll start. Um, so, aloha kakahiaka. It is morning, believe it or not, in Papahanao Mokuakea. Um, Malia Evans, I am the Oahu Outreach and Education Coordinator on behalf of Papahanao Mokuakea. Um, on board, I serve as the resource manager and also educator. So, our question this morning, we have, we are on our... Um, last week of being out in this beautiful Aina Akua, this sacred place. And um, we're all starting to shift our mindset from being ocean bound to thinking about returning to the islands. And so we're going to talk about what it is that we are been craving. And what's the first thing we want to eat when we get back to Oahu. So the thing I want to eat is poi which is like the staple. It's made out of taro, and it's like the staple of Hawaii uh, Hawaiian diet. Um, and kimchi. I miss my kimchi. <laughs> so Ooh. good. So poi and kimchi, that's what I want to eat. The poi I have not good. thought about that. There's a, uh, the Lalihi Bakery. Oh, Liliha Bakery, yes. has uh, kimchi, <gasps> kimchi fried, fried rice, rice with Portuguese sausage, scrambled so egg. Good. Oh, man. Oh, that's, that's good. That's my go to, yeah. Yeah. I forgot about that. Liliha Bakery. They actually opened a new one up in Pearl City. 
so closer to where we're going to be porting. Yeah, uh, they put me up at the uh, Ala Moana uh -huh. hotel, so I just walk over to the oh one my God, at Macy's. Yeah. yeah, they have one at Ala Moana Shopping Center. Yeah, hidden inside Macy's. You have to know where to look. Oh, good stuff over there. Yeah, yeah. what about you folks? Uh, yeah, Mike Brennan, uh, Maritime Archaeologist with Search. I'm the co-lead scientist for this expedition and watch lead for 48 Watch. Um, I've been craving grilled cheese. That's <laughs> uh, strangely one of the things that they don't make here, which they make pretty much everything, but uh, they haven't done that, so that's what I've been craving. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> wow. Wow. <laughs> So simple. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah Parody. I am part of the science and data team as a geologist, and I am a grad student at California State University, Long Beach. And the thing that I've been craving the most is sweet tea, and sweet tea specifically from Canes, and also a Canes Texas toast. I've been craving. Um, I've also been craving ice cream, but Somi Somi ice cream, which is a taro flavor. Oh, there you Ooh. go. Connection. I love taro. I, know, I don't think I've ever had Somi Somi. Somi Somi is so good. It's so good. And yeah, so that's what I've been craving. Hi, everyone. I'm Sebastian Martinez. Um, I'm a data logger here on Nautilus. Um, I'm also an undergraduate researcher at University of Hawaii at Manoa. Um, what I'm probably craving when I get back is a really good shake. Mm. Ideally, peanut butter. <laughs> that sounds good, too. That does sound good. Do you have any favorite place on Oahu that you like to get your shakes at, Sebastian? Um, I typically default to Jamba Juice as, as my usual place, just simply because it's on campus. But when I feel kind of fancy, I'll order it from Teddy's Bicker Burgers. <gasps> oh, yeah. They make great shakes. Awesome. Anybody in the front row want to start us off? Uh, oh, I can't hear you either. There it is. There it oh, is. Okay. Hey, good morning, everybody. This is Derek Sowers. Uh, I am the Mapping Operations Manager for Ocean Exploration Trust. Um, I'll be the navigator for this dive and um, I, I work out of Durham, New Hampshire when I'm not at sea. And uh, yeah, what I've been craving is every Friday night we do like homemade pizza at my house. Um, make a couple of those, top it with whatever we want. And uh, I guess we just did made some fresh pesto from our garden. So I'm looking forward to some pesto pizza. Nice. Ooh, so good. Sounds so good. good. What about I, you, Jake? I can go now, yeah. My name's Jake Bonney. I'm a, I'm the Hercules pilot in this watch, and I am craving, I guess I'm in the same boat as Derek. I'm always, we have we have our pizza nights once a week, and we throw whatever toppings we have on there, and fresh fresh tomatoes from the garden. But since I'm on the next leg, and I won't be back <laughs> for another month, I've been thinking about some ahi tuna poke uh, back on shore in, in uh, Honolulu. Oh, that sounds fresh, so good. Fresh ahi. Yeah. Yeah. When you go over to the Big Island, there's another good place in Hilo downtown that makes the best poke. Okay. Yeah, okay. I'll get that get, name for yeah, you. Yeah, I have to get the name for me. For me. I think it's amazing that you guys do pizza only once a week. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a low ball estimate. <laughs> right. <laughs> And hi, I'm Tito Kalacious, uh, Atalanta pilot, uh, typically chief pilot and expedition leader for the ROV Jason back at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, out here moonlighting. And I have a favorite pizza place. I hate to sound like the whole front row is all about pizza, but <laughs> Pizza Mammo in Chinatown mm. does a Detroit-style pizza that is my go-to first night in, last night in. I had one the night before we left. Uh, that's what I'm craving. That and a good cup of coffee. Mm. <laughs> oh. So uh, this is Ed, um, uh, the video engineer on this watch. Uh, so is it specifically on island or is it? No, yeah. whatever you desire. Well, yeah, I, I always go over to the bakery and get that uh, kimchi fried rice. 
like I said, with Portuguese sausage and uh, scrambled eggs. It's just become a, I don't even think about it anymore. It's just a reflex. As soon as I get there, it's what I go for. Um, and if I'm really lucky, I'll take it over to Kaneohe and have it at my auntie and uncle's place. And uh, But they're flying out to Florida the day after, so they'll probably be a little busy. We'll see. Uh, and uh, pre-pandemic, it, it would have been definitely going to Chinatown and going to Opal Thai food. Mm. Opal's is amazing. Love that guy. Love the restaurant. Uh, yeah, but, Thai food is so good. And there's lots of great places on Oahu. I don't crave a lot because I sail with so many snacks. <laughs> Speaking of, do you still have that last... Uh, famous Amos cookies. Uh, I think. Uh, Did you grind that one I already? I think Miss Jana got into that earlier. I don't know. Let's take a look. <laughs> we could auction it off. <laughs> oh boy. Nope, it's gone. There's a. Uh, gone. What's in it's here? All gone. Uh, there's a cliff bar left. Yeah, I've definitely learned to bring more sugar next time. <laughs> I ran out of my candy so fast. <laughs> You have to be careful because some of the vessels, uh, there's a Navy fleet of research vessels. It's operated by civilians, but owned by the Navy. And they typically have what looks very much like the candy aisle of a 7-Eleven there uh, <laughs> laid out 24 hours a day for you. Jake, how do we get the sonars going? I love Google Earth. <laughs> I really do. It's the only only sight of your semen that you're going to get. Thanks for telling me that. No, I just mean like that you can see them and you're not, oh, you can't okay. see them through I the water. <laughs> like that's the only way you can visualize them. Yeah. Well, I mean, I do watch, rewatch the Nautilus videos, so. Have we dived those? Yeah. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, that's where I got my samples from. Okay. <laughs> we didn't dive in this expedition. No. Ed, can you hear me? Yeah, just fine. So I can't hear you. Oh, there I am. Now you can. I swear, I thought I told you that. I'm on SPL, was that so if you listen to SPL, you would hear that, but huh. that was on like sometimes we do, yeah, sometimes we don't. Yep. Yeah, I did not know that. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I really thought that I was just seven. And then, I don't think you guys have it. I think only I have it. Yeah. I knew they were your Seamounts. I have a button over here that's the entire front She's row. She's very possessive of them. I just talk or listen to no, those. No, she gets sits there space. on the middle of the ocean of Harpoogan, just waiting. <laughs> no, I wish I got to go closer to them. This is the closest I've been to them. <laughs> We're going to be closer next time. Why? Where is the next one? It's like somewhere over here. Oh, so maybe not. Okay. Exciting. Oh, I, yeah, I'm not sure. It's near one of these. I'm not sure which one, though. Yeah, there's a lot. Is yeah. that an unknown seamount? I don't know. I don't know, but this that one's... That is unknown to me. This one's exciting. Yeah, Caldera. There's a caldera. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. And we only, um, we only noticed that when Rennie um, changed the shading. Um, it, it had been all kind of like one color on the... But he then changed the, uh, the bathymetry to be just for that seamount. And uh, when it turned red at the top, it, it really popped that there was a depression there so we all got excited oh so exciting <laughs> so exciting 
So if we were to take a sample in the caldera, what would that tell us? I don't know, but that makes me want to do that. I will be doing that for sure. It's at the end of the dive. We're not going to have to worry. Definitely do not need to meander. Yeah, we're going to go straight up. Where did I want to go look at something? I wanted to see something specific. So what, last night was pretty cool. We got our first glimpse of one of the um, atolls ah, um, in Papahanaumokuakea. So did you guys get a chance to see? No. Uh, I did not. I do know it was Pearl and Hermes. Yes. Yep. So the Hawaiian name for that is Holo Ika Uawa or Manavai. Um, so it is a beautiful, like you could literally glimpse the white sands oh, wow. along the, the edges that were facing us. But it was just beautiful. It was like right before maybe sunset oh, that wow. we were able to yeah. see it. Yeah, it was pretty cool. Oh, we haven't seen land for three weeks. So yeah. That was exciting. <laughs> it's like, can, can, we, can we go stop? <laughs> Swim over. You have to keep track to know that there could be volcanic plastics. OK. And what does that That's look cool. like to us? It's, well, green. it's, it it's green with dots. <laughs> no, it, I mean, we won't be able to tell because um, the manganese crust will be over it. but. Should we'll see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, what controversial media takes are we going to have this dive? Controversial what? Media takes. There's a squid. A squid. Me media takes? Media takes, so our movie tastes. Ah. Mm. Shall we... Do we need to continue our conversation on um, horse girl movies? No, we don't need to continue horse girl <laughs> movies. There's too many of them that we We have uh, some transit coming up. And uh, I have uh, some films, one in particular that might be enjoyable for a movie night in the lounge on the way back in. Master and Commander. Uh, starts with a B. It's in theaters now. In theaters now. Barbie. Oh, there you go. Oh no, we won't be watching that. Oh man, you well, have you no know, idea what you're missing. It's a good missing. movie. It's a surprisingly good movie. Yeah, it so was. Good. It was a very what I expected. Wait, what? Barbie. Oh, Barbie. Very high production quality, and it definitely had some moments in there that I felt were um, impactful. Yes. Um, good word. Word. It, it yep. was. It was. It was. It was. It happened. I mean, the costuming was fantastic. Set design was fantastic. Acting. Ryan I mean, Gosling was fantastic. Yeah, actor choices, fantastic. Um, yeah, I am. Yep. <laughs> nope. Hannah's being Google judged Earth. for using Google Earth <laughs> on a mapping vessel. Okay, okay. <laughs> I just wanted to see where it was in relation to the Seamounts I study. And it, it is close. Like, it's part of the same thing, supposedly. Good night. <laughs> I use... I, I use both. <laughs> it's funny. I like it. But, okay, so my hot take on Barbie, and I know people will disagree with me, but I feel like America Ferrari's speech, Ferreira, sorry, speech was not as impactful as I thought it was going to be. It was realizations that I made at the age of 12. However, I did cry at the end when Margot um, Robbie... Remember that we have a public audience who may or may not have seen Barbie. Okay. Don't ruin it. But basically, no at the end, besides America Ferreira's speech, there was a big moment, a montage of all the people that worked on the movie. I didn't know this till after, but it was really, that, that was moving and I, I did cry. Um, and any moment that she has with like an older woman, I just like get so emotional. Hmm. Those were good moments. Those are great moments. Can you, you, and can you I wish move there were more of those in your the microphone movie. up a little more in front of your mouth for me? Like right in front, Hannah? 
Yeah. Can you move your microphone up just a little bit, like in front of your mouth? Uh, it's like... <laughs> it's practically in okay. your mouth already. That actually sounds better. <laughs> yeah, okay. It was like... Really She's loud. Close. She's loud to me. I thought it was a great movie. And it I, was good, though. I had three generations, so my granddaughters um, were there. My three granddaughters, um, my daughters, and myself. My son um, came with us. Um, my older son didn't want to, but my younger son did. And we all dressed up in pink. <laughs> it was, it was so fun. Much. It was an event for us. And so um, I think we all came out of it very um, empowered, you know, as, as uh, women, as wahine. Um, and uh, yeah, I went in, sur I was surprisingly shocked at the content because I had no idea. I didn't read about it. And I just went along <laughs> with it, but I was, I felt very empowered. And I think my uh, grandchildren, my granddaughters did as well. I really believe it was filled with really special moments that I'm really glad they decided to choose to do. I, well, I can't, I can't say any of my favorite parts because I'm going to spoil. Nope. But, um, yeah, I was, I was happy with what I had watched. I was really satisfied. But there were some parts where I was like, okay, they could have done this and then would have been made better. But I think you could say that with like every movie. Mm -hmm. But I loved it. I love Greta Gerwig. Love her work. Lady Bird, fantastic. Oh, yeah. Little Woman, fantastic. But, yeah. I was... I was really happy with it. And then after, I, I know, I dressed up for Barbie, and then I <laughs> dressed up for Oppenheimer. <laughs> so, well, basically, okay, so you for- You dressed up for Oppenheimer. Okay, well- What does that look do wear, like? Do you wear heavy sunglasses? <laughs> no, 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 you just wear black. Oh, oh. welding gotcha. helmet. You just wear black. Big mm. trench coat. Well, I didn't wear a trench coat because it was July, but <laughs> I did like wear, darker tones mm -hmm. to set like to go with the mood was it like a reversible from the pink shirt or yes it w no 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 i so i did it i did barbie on a thursday and then i did oppenheimer on a friday so i wore pink on thursday and then darker colors on friday squid hey tori Hey, Tori. Tori's Hi. with us. Back, Tori. I'm back for 15 minutes. I got another one. How was your interaction? 4.45. It was awesome. It was with um, some first grade elementary students um, from my school district. So it was nice. always really fun to connect with them. So can you tell us who you are and what food you're craving when you get back to the island? Oh. Yeah, Malia thought of a good one. Nice. Yeah, I had yeah. one ready, and then I was like, wait, I'm not going to start with y'all. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tori Hunt. I am sailing as a science communicator. This is my very first time sailing, and when I'm not teaching, I am a high school science teacher from North Carolina, so I've been doing some interactions this morning with students from uh, my school district, and something that I'm craving when I get home, um, honestly, probably like a home-cooked meal from my mom, like our Aww. traditional like Sunday dinner. So, mm, I love that. That's good stuff. Mama's cooking with love. Thanks. I know. <laughs> but Tori, what was your question? Because maybe we, we can answer Oh, we can go around it. Yeah. 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 Or we can save it for, for our next watch. No. Yeah, if, no. if it's a really good one, you can save it for the final watch. It well, might be a nice not. one for we, the final watch. We have watch. three more watches. Okay. Okay. We have three more? I was told two, including this one. What? Dives. Oh, that is a 24-hour mm -hmm. dive. two dives so. per watch. Oh, two dives per watch. Oh, for two watches, watches yeah. <laughs> Okay, for watches, yeah. I think we need more coffee in this van. <laughs> <laughs> what have y'all been up to so far? Uh, oh, we talked about Barbie. Talking about Barbie. Okay. Speaking for myself, or pizza. I've been listening to them talking pizza about Barbie. The front row. Pizza. Uh -huh. yeah. And the yeah, front row has been craving pizza big time. Pizza. We've been having some pizza sometimes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they sometimes, like when we come into port, we give the cooks a couple of days off. So they usually have pizza one night, Thai food another mm -hmm. night, bring some food in. Yeah, they deserve uh, some time off. Oh, yeah. Agreed. They're so, 
They've been uh, so amazing. Cooking three meals a day for this many people, I just can't imagine it. Yeah, mm -hmm. it is one of the tough things yeah. uh, current day is if you're on leg after leg, uh, you don't get to, you can't go to a restaurant, you can't really do anything when we're in port. So it's a small consolation to get some nice food brought out to the vessel for dinner. Appreciate that. Tito, if you've been craving a good cup of coffee, have you tried the coffee maker in the forward lounge? I haven't, as I don't have beans. There's beans There's there. Beans there. There's there. Well, yeah. I'm gonna have to try that. I do that like four times a day. Yeah. There's a there's a there's massive bags of French roast in there. there. It's always it's always full. Yeah. Just go in, push the coffee or espresso, and then push play, and yeah, it does everything. I'm there. Yeah. And, absolutely. And just leave it on. Yeah, you're welcome for it. It turns itself off, unfortunately. Does, is that why it's always off? Yeah, it's always it turns itself off. That drives yeah. me nuts. It's like, annoying. Yeah. It's not that much electricity to just leave it on. No, it's not us turning it off. But <laughs> considering it could throw itself off of there and Do heavy you have seas. some milk up there for uh, cappuccinos? No, it doesn't have that. Uh, I always I just go to the the mess and and is there splash a little milk in fridge up there. There's a fridge in your stateroom, right? No, and no. Uh, under the sink okay, on the port that side? Yeah, not I think that it's I under the sink. Not that I found yeah, it. Yeah, I think least. it's under the sink oh. on the port side. I didn't look. If there's milk in there, it's probably long expired. Because <laughs> no one, no one's, actually someone added, some, I, I think the little thing that you're supposed to put the milk in for the cappuccino, someone filled water with because I think they didn't know where to put water. So it's full of water right now and I don't know how to empty it. <laughs> um. Yeah, I don't know. I know that it does cappuccinos, but I don't know how that works because I haven't been bold enough to try. Exploding hot milk is not something I feel like dealing with. That's um, fair. I'm reading about caldera for seamounts. I don't think you make cappuccinos with that either. Or the <laughs> caldera. And um, they're, they produce sizable pumice. Pumice rafts. Oh, that's so cool. maybe we'll see a lot of pumice. Who knows? Yeah. Or maybe yeah, some Jake, of the pumice we've already seen from it. Landing yeah. where we are. Okay. See some batriolo rocks. <laughs> batriolo Bat 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 Doesn't matter. Very close. Yeah. Good try. <laughs> and what you think it is is not close. <laughs> okay. I saw some fish when. They first went into the water. Any Those sharks? were not fish. They weren't fish. Those what? were shoal schools of squid. Oh, what is a school of squid called? A school. No, oh, is, is a it school? really? A lot of people want it to be called fun. a squad of squid, which is totally cool, but yeah, it's not um, been adopted that's by like the, the masses. That's like the only group of animals that does not have a name. That is so sad. That is so boring. <laughs> What? I oh. think you're muted. <laughs> yep, like hui. It's a Hawaiian word for like a group. A hui of squid. There you go. Hui of squid. Yeah. That sounds way cooler. Way cooler. Hui of squid. No, it's a, a group of squid is called a shoal. Uh, I think well, we just debated. renamed it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Shoal squid does work as well, but it's also a very common used term for other animals. It is funny how so many different things have different names for groups, like a murder of crows or a group of ROV pilots is called a grump. <laughs> Good one. Good one. <laughs> I had just thought of it the other day, but I think we're the tallest front row I've ever been in. Oh, really? oh yeah. All right, I'll have to sit up a little more. <laughs> yeah, no, lower my chair. It's all the pizza. <laughs> it's gotta be. It's always the pizza. Yeah. It does, it, does the body good. <laughs> this should make you excited. What? Oh, um. Uh, I think the, uh, um, uh, Hannah is trying to explain Giot morphology to a Giot scientist. <laughs> you know, I'm just trying to be helpful, okay? You're so mean to me. I'm like, oh, he's going to be so excited about this. And then you're just like, 
No. <laughs> no, I'm excited. It's going to be a very, very cool Is opportunity to see a caldera G here. G-R-I-O-T? No, it's G-U-Y-O-T. I was going to say, because uh, G... G-R-I-O-T is a class in uh, West Africa of storytellers uh, that use song and story to maintain their oral history. Cool. They're called griots. So in Hawaiian, um, the griot is called a mauna kai palahalaha. 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 Hala, hala, hala. Oh, what was the first hala, part again? Hala. Mauna Kai. Oh, Mauna Kai. So Mauna Kai is a sea mount. Yes. But a guilt is a Mauna Kai Palahalaha. 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 Pa Does that section of the word mean anything in particular? or? I have, I'm sure it does. But I will have to check on exactly, because that's some of the new vocabulary that was created um, by our cultural working group you know, to to express these terms on the expedition. So, yeah, I'll look that up. Definitely it has a meaning. I imagine it's referring to either something flat or table-like. Yeah, because like a pa, it could be like a, t a, t a flat surface. Yep. So I just checked and it looks like uh, I'll be fortunate enough to be going home to 47 degrees and raining. Wow. Lovely. But the rain should stop in uh, July. Oh, well, not too far. July? Okay, yeah, that's just around the corner. Yeah. Okay. Sarcasm. How yeah. cold? 47. Oh, uh, 55 in what's hole. Yeah, our high will go up to the 50s, but I get in late, late. All right, y'all, I'm about to hop off again. I'll be back. All right. All right. Enjoy. 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 my last one. Yeah, it's let's running let's see. When I go home, it'll be oh, nice. like in the mid-80s. It's running cool over in Kona, like mid-80s. Mid and thunderstorms. Uh, sounds like Jacksonville. I was yeah, just saying, that sounds like Florida. Today, yep. Nice. Not so bad. Let me see. Where? What about me? And yeah, I haven't checked the weather in a month. <laughs> High in Anchorage today of 45. I have no idea. Where? Toasty. Low of 34. Yeah. Oh, I got a good paint ticket to LA though. I think I'm gonna. The last expedition I was on, I was the only American, and so everyone was talking in Celsius. I was like, I don't know what you people are talking about. <laughs> no, I can switch back I and forth. I cannot easy. get my head around. Like, I can do meters and kilometers and that sort of stuff, but I cannot do temperature. It's just so bizarre to me. Huh. I'm like, 17 degrees, it's freezing. Oh, so Sebastian, to answer your question, the, the palahalaha, it means to be flat to be ah. spread out, extended, or broadened. So it's a sea mount that is that. Very good descriptor then. Mm -hmm. So for the uh, Celsius users, it'll be about eight or nine degrees when I get home. My high when I go back home will be 71. So, Malia, can you tell us about um, how the cultural group is comprised? Sure thing. So, um, a really integral part of the um, management strategies of Papahanaumokuakea is this advisory, advisory group called the Native Hawaiian Cultural Working Group. And that was actually um, kind of initiated when Papahanaumokuakea was the Northwest Hawaiian Islands Coral Reef Ecosystem Reserve before it was designated as a monument. And so this group is composed of Native Hawaiian um, scholars, uh, scientists, educators, cultural practitioners from around all of the main Hawaiian islands. And they've been just really instrumental in guiding um, you know, the managed best practices, um, the, the weaving of indigenous um, culture and language, um, values into everything that we do. 
and they just and you have, mind you these are people who volunteer their time you know who are raising their children and working full time and you know have a lot of other responsibilities but because of their deep love um, and aloha aloha aina um, their love for homeland their love for um, Hawaiian culture that they've just really invested so much um, of their knowledge and energy into Papahana Mokoakea. And so they help on all fronts from whether it's the permit reviews, um, which we all know are so important, um, you know, when you come out to this Aina Okua, this sacred place, to creating names, you know, part of this nomenclature is um, group is to create names they'll, they'll be working on the seamounts that we write currently are unnamed seamounts um, they give names to new species that are discovered um, in just in really important parts of cultural practice like collecting carcasses of seabirds that are used for cultural practice like tattooing and the creation of, of feather artifacts and and um, regalia and um, just like we were just talking about the naming um, creating new vocabulary for you know these kind of contemporary expeditions and so they're just really just such an important part in guiding the practices that are, that are occurring up here in the research and um, you know part of that is our center in Hilo so we have one of the few public spaces at Mokupapapa um, Discovery Center where the Hawaiian language is integrated into everything that we do. Our exhibits are bilingual. We have um, Hawaiian language, Olelo Hawaii, and English. Um, we offer um, classes in Olelo Hawaii to our Hawaiian immersion schools. And this just goes towards more of the normalization of Hawaiian language, which is a official language of Hawaii. Um, so just really kind of cutting edge in regards to indigenous led um, guidelines and leadership in indigenous spaces. So yeah, we just, and they're actually meeting right now over in Hilo at Mokupapapa Discovery Center for the last two days, yesterday and today. And really talking about these really important things, you know, and where are we going in the future and what are some of those um, goals that um, we have in mind for Papahana Mokokia and, and the best management of this place and including sanctuary designation. So lots of uh, big, big goals and big objectives for the next couple of years. So mahalo for asking, Sebastian. Of course, thank you for explaining. So I, I know you mentioned the bird carcasses and similar practices of that and how they're connected to tattoos. Would you like to elaborate further on that? Sure. So um, traditional Hawaiian tattoos is called tatau. Um, huh. And this is done um, with the best instruments for this are like the Laison albatross, um, albatross bones. They're very light, but they're also very strong. And so traditionally, um, Tatao artists would gather the, the dead, um, the carcasses of birds that have passed and utilize the bones for their instruments. So the process is a, pretty much a tapping. So like the guns, um, I, don't, I never had a tattoo, so I don't know what the contemporary ones look like, but it's this, this continual incessant tapping against the skin. And they use like a little mallet to put the ink into the skin, so breaking that skin surface. And um, so those bones are really important for the continuation of cultural practice. Um, also, we use the feathers. Feathers are like one of the most um, important um, materials in creating these amazing, I know you folks have seen like the Hawaiian feather capes, the ahu'ulas. So these are just these beautiful, um, intricate um, capes that the ali'i would wear and they could go all the way down to the toes like the full length or shorter ones but made of the most amazing feathers and so part of that is um, also creating kahili which are really emblems or symbols of the chiefs 
So they would be like these tall feather standards. So recently, one of the items that was created was using the Laysan albatross, the moli um, feathers from um, birds that were collected that had passed. And they created these beautiful feather standards that stand in Iolani Palace, which is um, the home. It's beautiful. If you guys ever get a chance, check it out um, in Honolulu. Iolani Palace was the home of King David Kalakaua and um, his queen and is just a stunning example of um, a chiefly residence. So the standards actually stand right next to the two thrones that are there. So, you know, that cultural practice is important, that it's not something of the past that's relegated to museums, but is a living cultural dynamic practice that we still continue. So Papahana Mokuakea plays a really big role in being, being able to access those, um, those uh, materials to continue cultural practice. That's really amazing. And I also do support the idea that if you're in Hawaii to go visit Iolani Palace, mm -hmm. I actually volunteered there for three days as a interpreter for my um, upper division Hawaiian history course. Um, it's a very, very culturally significant area in Hawaii, especially in downtown Honolulu. Um, and there's a lot of interesting history there in regards to the monarchy, the Hawaiian monarchy, and um, the major, uh, more truthful events to Hawaii's, um, what's the proper term would you use? Not annexation. Um, um, occupation. Occupation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they, they had um, very progressive, the Hawaiian kingdom leadership, very progressive. So Iolani Palace had electricity um, a couple of years before the White House and Buckingham Palace, which were kind of two of those kind of icons of civilization. And so um, just amazing telephones, you know, just an amazing progression of Hawaiian um, leadership in the world. Yeah, so encourage anybody who visits Hawaii, lives in Hawaii, um, an important part of our um, history. I had no idea. Wait, how do you say the word ta 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 Okay. That's really cool that they use albatross bones. That's that's insane. How I wonder how they even came up with that. Yeah, cuz it's that deep understanding of like mm -hmm. what tools do you need to do the job? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, living on islands, you, your resources are less than if you're on a continent. So um, I just, I think it's brilliant. Mm -hmm. You know, you use what you have and then you modify, you adapt. And um, just the, the, the material culture that came out of Hawaii was just so outstanding. Wow. Do they still do that today? Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. So it's a practice that, um, actually a really good friend of mine is a Tatao artist and um, yeah, it's and it's a Polynesian. I know you folks have seen like a lot of like the poly sleeves mm -hmm. and you know, so it is a practice that's really um, been reignited throughout Polynesia. And so it's, you know, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful practice. And there's deep meaning. So you don't just get a tatau just to adorn your body. Oftentimes there's a genealogical. So the, the artist will ask you, who are you? Who do you come from? What is your family name? You know, so there's this genealogical, you're telling the story of your ohana as you put these um, tatau yeah, on your body. Not just a random pattern that you choose because you like what it, you know, there's symbolism in Absolutely, a lot of and the, there's connection yeah. to your past. So do they, so do you have an idea when you go to them or 
you go to them and then you tell them your past and then they make the design. So from what I understand, um, my friend, um, they actually go into prayer. So they will um, first assess you to see if you're ready to receive because it is a gift. You know, these are not just tata or not just for anybody who just wants to have one. You have to really understand why. Um, and then okay. they'll ask um, questions of you to determine that. Um, ask you who your family is. So you need to know your genealogy. Um, and then they'll put it into prayer and put it out there so that the spiritual um, world can give you the gift of what that tatao is. So that's just one practice. I know I'm sure there's others out there that other people um, are involved in, but that's the only one that I know of. I know this is probably really silly, but it reminds me of in Moana when Maui, he tells his story through his tattoos. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that was the only thing that I could like compare like visually in my head, which is really kind of, I don't know how I feel if my one thing is Moana that I'm like comparing this to. Right. So, yeah, that was a very controversial movie in yeah, the Polynesian. Um, I can imagine. Throughout Polynesia. I think they got some things really right. And then some other things I was like, eh. <laughs> it had to be Disneyfied, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. <laughs> but that was that was the first thing that came into my head about your tattoos telling stories mm -hmm. about your family and your origin. I think that's so cool. I mean, I don't, I'm too scared to get a tattoo, but I, I appreciate the thought that goes into how they make theirs. Oh, right. Yeah. Such deep intention. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think I, I'll be, I'm, Afraid to get a tattoo for a different reason, more that I think I'm a little bit too much, of, I would be too much of a perfectionist about it. And even if I did get perfect, a perfect tattoo on me, I think I'll learn to nitpick it to death. Yeah. Yeah, I think if they made uh, like a six month long tattoo, I'd be all over it because uh, luckily I'm self aware enough that. Uh, you know, maybe having a Van Halen tattoo wouldn't be something I want my whole life. <laughs> so. Uh, sounded good when you were 18. Yeah, and luckily, never, just never, yeah, it's just like, nope, not forever. I don't know, I keep telling my son he needs to get a big mom over oh, his yeah, heart, with, with but he rose. just keeps resisting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> One day. <laughs> One day. I think I'm too indecisive to get a tattoo. Oh, boot. Yeah. You don't have to be that decisive. You just have to get multiple. I have like 12. No. No, 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 no. I mean, when you change your mind, you just get a different one. No. <laughs> Plus, I, I'm really like, I don't like needles. It doesn't look like a needle. Looks like a gun. Yeah. Yep. It actually no. looks like neither. It just looks like a, a thick pen no. that makes a buzzing noise. I'm good. I'm good. They're okay. cool, though. <laughs> but I can't do that. I have, like, so many neat ideas for, like, tattoos for myself, but at the same time, as I said earlier. You know yeah, you but need? if you get one on your back, you won't be able to see it. I, so. I got it. You need a tattoo <laughs> surrogate. A tattoo surrogate? Yeah, you design the tattoo and it gets put on somebody else. And then, huh. uh, then you can, you know, check in on it every once in a while. And <laughs> <laughs> there are people that actually do that. They sell designs for tattoos. But they're not tattoo artists themselves? No. No. I think it was being more a tattoo surrogate, like we get put my tattoos on somebody else. Okay. That's, yeah, that's, that's, uh... That's a new one. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure I... The only reason why I know that there are artists that do that is because there's like been controversy around people stealing tattoo ideas. Mm -hmm. so, oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> do you want to go or? Um, you can go. So, Miss Malia, <laughs> do people recognize other people by their same tattoos? Like, do some people have similar tattoos if they're from the same family? Hmm, I'm not sure. Okay. I don't. I I don't know. Yeah. I was just curious. Because I think about how some families have crests. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if tattoos are similar to crests. I yeah, know. I don't, I, I honestly cannot answer that. Yeah, I don't they, know well, that I much it sounds like it's more um, like with the prayer, and the, it's, it's more interpretive by the artist based on the genealogy. Like, yeah. my, my brother has our family crest tattooed. Um, and that doesn't change, but it, 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 I expect that it would probably change by the artist and the person as they're doing yeah, it. Yeah, and I don't know. Yeah, I, I just can't answer that question because yeah. I have no idea. <laughs> That's fair. I was just, I was just thinking, if it, like, if it's uprooted in your family, that you and your dad or you and your mom can have probably similar tattoos. My um. Or like you have a combination of your mom and your dad mm -hmm, so it's mm -hmm. both of them My and then sister. it depends where they come from too mm -hmm. right like if you're irish you may have like celtic or gaelic yeah. and yeah because they actually are very interesting like the gaelic um tattoos and their stonework and there's some very interesting similarities between like irish culture and hawaiian culture which i find very fascinating you know, from even their their uh, stonework and um, the tattoo symbols, it's interesting. Yeah, I haven't done a deep dive in there, but just on yeah. the surface. My sister has a couple tattoos, but they're that are done with white ink. Actually, we have a shipmate who has tattoos in white ink, and for light-skinned people, it's interesting because you don't notice it day to day. Unless they point it out, you mm. wouldn't really see it. But once they do, you're like, oh, I totally see that. Kind of the best of both worlds. Yeah. Um, but boy, uh, for you know us older people, it's the uh, perception of tattoos has changed so much in the last 20 years that they, you know, they used to, you know, keep you from getting a job. And now it's not unusual for your kid's preschool teacher to have a sleeve or to have a lot of tattoos. Yeah. Still. Hawaiian Airlines still doesn't. If you have a tattoo, they won't hire you. Well, it's <laughs> most yeah. flight attendants. Yeah. The uh, flight attendant industry is very, very strict. And in Japanese culture, there's an association with tattoos. That yeah, you can't go into their um, the spas or the, the yeah, the yeah, the onsens yeah. and yeah. But that is a changing, I think, you know, as more and more people get tattoos. And it doesn't have those associations for certain cultures. Mm -hmm. I'm curious to see how uh, face tattoos fare, because I know there's a lot of the younger generations getting face tattoos, but not necessarily cultural ones. Mm -hmm. So I'm very curious to see where that work goes and how that impacts um, job something for viability. Yeah, especially in um, Aotearoa. So that's a very common practice. Well, it was a common practice for women also to get um, the tatawo on their face. And then for the men. Um, and I think there was a really big um, conflict because there was some guy, boxer guy, I think, like 20 years ago who did a, a oh, yeah. Mike, Tyson. Mike Tyson. Yeah, and kind of that idea of cultural appropriation. Like, you know, be, if the it's genealogical, yeah. you know, that's your genealogy that you're wearing, then who are you to have a face tattoo like that? Yeah, yeah so that a, was interesting. I don't think there's a lot of story it's about anyone giving them grief. Uh, yeah, yeah. Even more interesting is who's the person who uh, had the guts to tattoo Mike Tyson's face? Like, if he didn't like it, you're done. I imagine he paid a lot for 
a very good tattoo artist to do it. It is interesting. There's some things that you find a similar thread as you move through the South Pacific and uh, Polynesian land, uh, islands that you see. And there's also things that are like very specific to um, certain places that really stand out. Uh, I'm trying to think of an example. The um, Tahitian, I forget the name, it's like Ma Mahu, Ma Ma Mahri, Mahu, I think. I don't remember. The third, you mean the third gender? The third yes, gender, Mahu. Yeah. yeah. Mahu. Uh -huh. Mahu, that's yeah. it, yeah. And that's, uh, that's very prevalent um, throughout Polynesia. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And it's really, um, it's to me, because I grew up with many Mahu, mm -hmm. um, it's so accepted. Right. Like, there's none of that discrimination that happens in Eurocentric kind of cultures. Mahu were just accepted as that third gender. Oh, if and I remember yeah, right, they were very that, it was like culturally the youngest born was a male they were raised uh, That's for Afine in Samoa. Uh, uh, yeah. Okay. Yep. So in Hawaii, a little different practice. But a lot of our mahu are actually um, very connected spiritually, artistically, um, with hula, with cultural practice. Um, you know, so they were really um, not revered, but just just an integral part of Hawaiian culture. You know, there wasn't any like discrimination. That didn't happen until um, like the military when the military came over, and it was just a real accepted. You know, it's it wasn't a big deal. I had so many mahu in my family. Um, and it just is what it is. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's one thing I've really enjoy, enjoyed about um, Hawaiian and Polynesian culture in general is how fluid they are in terms of gender and sexuality mm -hmm. and how they're accepted and see it in the, in the scope of their own culture. Right. It, they definitely a lot of the more um, Eurocentric and mainland cultures could really learn a thing or two about um, accepting people with different backgrounds and genders and sexualities in the way that Polynesian cultures do. Mm -hmm. And that's true because even during Hawaiian Kingdom times, um, when blacks were being, you know, totally ostracized and in Hawaii. Black people were welcomed as equal citizens in the Hawaiian Kingdom. We had people from all over the world who were citizens of the Hawaiian Kingdom. And so that's why when I talk about progressive, you know, Hawaiian Kingdom was that place where all people were accepted. There was equality across the board, like the color of your skin didn't matter. Um, our ali'i, when our ali'i are the chief when they were traveling in America, were treated so awful. Uh, we're talking about chiefs, royalty, you know, people who come from status, and they were treated so awfully by Americans, told to get to the back of the train, or they weren't allowed on the train because they're black. Um, you know, the racism that occurred, and it's all documented in um, the writings of our chiefs as they went across the world. And not all Americans treated them like that. You know, they were welcomed in certain um, areas, but it was very, it's really painful to read that, to see how your chiefs were treated. And um, when they were leaders and welcomed into, you know, the royal palaces and welcomed in other countries. So, you know, it, it speaks a lot about how we welcome and treat people who are different than us. Oh. Oh, sorry, I thought that was an eel for a second. Uh, some of my friends are really trying to talk me into uh, 
getting a tattoo to commemorate my time in Hawaii because I've lived seven years in Hawaii. It's been, played an integral role in the, that's what I'm looking for, integral era of my mm -hmm. uh, um, adulthood. So they're like, uh, they keep on suggesting ideas. And um, one that I actually kind of like they've, that I suggested is using that, um, I forgot the term we used exactly, um, that um, mountain to sea connection between oh, yeah. certain species. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Kind of like representing that in the form of a he'e that instead of opening up into tentacles, opens up into a hibiscus. Mm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Because I feel that's a more respectful way of representing my time in Hawaii than getting something more culturally sensitive to local Hawaiians and Polynesians. Right. And I love that you're thinking that way. You know, the intention, yeah, mm -hmm. of, of that. So that that's actually a he'e, is a representation of Kanaloa, who is our god of the sea. And then um, the hibiscus is not a native. So if anything, I would recommend a ohi'a. Um, a lehua. So a lehua is a really important cultural um, plant, tree, forest to um, Kanaka O'ivi. And it, it's beautiful. Like, you know what the lehua looks like, yes. yeah? It's red. Normally it's red, but there are other colors. But it's just a, a beautiful flower that um, just has so much cultural um, importance. That's something, definitely something for me to think about if I do decide to go down that path. Yeah, yeah. Now, actually, we do have um, hibiscus that are native. I think the ke'o ke'o. Um, there are certain hibiscus that are, that are endemic. I think I'll have to do my research yes, on that one. Yes, yep. Maybe a non-native thing would be appropriate for you if you come here and uh, spent so much time, seems to align. I can see the direction there, but at that point, it kind of loses the connection to Hawaii. Uh, if right. I don't use a yeah. cultural plant, especially since many octopuses and he'es do look very similar in the shallow water environment. It might be hard to differentiate in a tattoo. If there was some way to visually capture the feeling of being under the uh, banyans in punch bowl. Uh, that's just an experience I uh, always love. Love going up there. The banyan trees are always super impressive to me. Very unique looking trees that, um, and very unique morphologies that you don't really see many other places, especially in the U.S. We're talking about, are those the trees that have the like long... The aerial roots? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. They're so crazy. Wait, aren't they, are they not from Hawaii? No. I think I read that, that they were also like a species that was introduced to mm -hmm. Hawaii. Yeah. And I was shocked. Yeah, they're not, they're not uh, native to Hawaii. But they do provide some beautiful shade in lots of areas, including Lahaina. I think they um, said that the Lahaina Banyan, which is like world famous, um, actually is showing signs of growth. So, I mean, that, to me, that's such a beautiful symbol of the potential for Lahaina to, you know, um, have that growth. And, like, recovery. And recovery, yes. Yep. One of our former video engineers who spent much more time working for this organization than I ever have uh, is retired now and volunteers for the American Red Cross. She's based out of Tennessee, but just spent several weeks uh, volunteering over on Maui to assist those affected by the fire. Yeah, so oh, awesome, great. these people who come over to help, and yeah, couldn't do it without them. Do you know, Ed, is she still there? No, she's gone back home, oh, okay. but... Um, I can't really share it. If you look on her social media, she was uh, yeah had some interesting tidbits about who's stepping up and helping those people specifically with like checks. Yeah. Uh, um,
she played a huge role in this organization and uh, how they do video. She worked on our previous vans. Never got to work in these, but when we built these, I flew her down to Mississippi where we were working on them at the time. And uh, she got to see what the next generation was going to work with. As a matter of fact, this countertop I'm sitting at, uh, we got her to sign it underneath so it bears her signature. And the years that she worked uh, with OET and his predecessor, and more importantly with Dr. Ballard. My mom just sent me a picture of the bon. It was banyan trees. Is that how you pronounce it? Banyan. Banyan trees in Palm Beach, Florida. I did not know that Palm Beach had it. But hi, mom. I know you're watching. I hi. love you. Hi, hi Hannah's, Hannah's mom. mom. <laughs> <laughs> she's at work. Naturally, she's listening to me. <laughs> Hopefully it's not like customer service. She's like, excuse me, I'm busy. <laughs> I don't know. She's really good at multitasking. She does a lot of her work while watching a Real Netflix. Housewives of any of them. <laughs> Maybe we shouldn't go there. <laughs> she's, she's good at multitasking, though. I feel um, Horse Girl Movies is the upper extent of media craziness that we will be addressing on this stream. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying maybe we, we shouldn't have a conversation about what her parents do at work. <laughs> yeah, it got dad into trouble the other day. So. <laughs> maybe we'll just stop it right here. No, and um, yeah, one of like my favorite shows to watch with my mom is Below Deck, so it's been kind of crazy. Oh, I've seen an episode or two of that. Yes, yes. What's that? Oh, I don't want to know. Never mind. Why did I just <laughs> oh, say that? <laughs> Hold on, let me turn your microphone off. <laughs> It's just life on a big yacht. How about workers. this water, huh? Life on a big yacht, okay. And that's for like the more rich, oh. not like a cruise line, yeah? So it's just like yes, our boat. more rich, yes. It's exactly like a like huge here. yacht and yeah. a lot, it's just drama between the workers. Mm. But I'm actually kind of upset that I didn't learn a lot of boat language. Maritime yeah, maritime knowledge. Yeah. I'm really disappointed that it didn't prepare me for this. Well, well, clearly we, the we yacht can life. We give you the 30-second boat <laughs> course real quick. So pointy end, flat end. The up, float. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I learned a lot during the archaeolog archaeological dives. Have you learned how to tie a bowline? No. Oh, we have to oh, teach you that one. I to teach you a knot. Knot or two, trucker's hitch. Yeah, I have no idea what that is either. Oh, yeah. Do we have a rope in here? <laughs> How do you uh, do it? Uh, do we have line? That's a great question. Actually, it's not line until it's fixed When I to went something. to the Hawaiian Museum on the Big Island, the one that we talked about that has the, the aquarium and the art installation of um, recycled, recyclable plastics in it, I forgot what it was called. Um, you mean Moku Pa Papa yes. Discovery Center in yes. Hilo? They had how to tie different knots. Yes, we have that upstairs. Yeah. Yes, and I sat there for a very long time trying to learn how to tie knots. And I did <laughs> yeah. take pictures of them on my phone because I was like, what if one day I need to tie a knot? And then I was like, well, maybe I won't have my phone on me if I have to tie a knot. So then I was like, Maybe this is counterproductive, but it was so much fun. Yeah, that's one of our most popular exhibits, is that knot tying. It's so useful. I mean, oh, literally, it was so much fun. knowing how to tie knots properly is so important. So we are about, sorry to jump in. Oh, okay. uh, we're about 400 meters from the seabed. Um, so I thought um, I'd give the people watching on Nautilus Live a quick summary of what we're about to dive on. Um, so at 2295 meters, almost 2300 meters uh, below, we're diving on a seamount, which is currently unnamed. We're calling it Site 15, but it, that's, I think that's just a list of um, 
uh, expedition plan targets numbers. I don't think they're officially numbered this, um, but it, it's a it's a tall kind of a tall seamount um, that uh, when we were doing the dive planning, we noticed has a, a depression in, in the at the top, which we think is a extinct caldera. So it'll be very interesting. Uh, geologically to take a look at if we can see any evidence of uh, eruptions or, or collapse there, but also because it, uh, it has a additional ridges and high points for uh, corals and other biology to live on. So this will be an exciting dive. We actually changed the dive plan once we saw that to start a little shallower than we were going to because we wanted to have more time um, up in the caldera. So we're going to kind of go a little quicker on the, on the lower parts. Uh, still good to get eyes on it. Uh, but we're going to try to try to back end our time onto the uh, onto the caldera. Um, so it'll be about a 24-hour dive, um, and yeah, excited to get down there and see what's there. Exciting. Yeah, this is super exciting. Tori, welcome back. Hi. Yes, I'm back, and I will be here for the rest of our watch now. Woo. Don't worry, we'll stop gossiping about you. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Have we seen anything else? I think I saw a jelly pop up. I don't remember if that was during this interaction or the last one. Um, we've seen, for stuff. We've seen a couple of miscellaneous jellyfish, a couple of squid. Nothing super notable. I mean, the giant squid that kind of just passed by briefly. That was okay. I'm not falling for it this morning. <laughs> No, Tor is not Tor. playing. No, I don't know what it was the other day that y'all got me with. Or maybe y'all were serious. I don't remember. Is this dive plan that's printed out the updated one? The 2009. Yeah. Uh, updated in what way? I thought you said that uh, the dive plan was changed. Oh, no, that was just when we were downstairs oh, dive okay. planning. We, um, yeah, we, no, we didn't, we didn't change it after we uh, had made it. Nice. This is going to be a good one. Derek, it seems like you've got some uh, mastermind plan going here. <laughs> what are you up to? Yeah, um, so we we remapped this ridge line this morning oh, right before oh, yeah. the dive. Okay. Um, so Rennie had just loaded up into high pack updated 10 meter contour lines. Yeah, okay. Um, at a 50 meter resolution grid, so those contours derived from a 50 meter elevation model instead of a 100 meter. So it's a lot more detailed. So I was just basically updating the waypoints and some interim waypoints. Okay, cool. Yeah, no, I. To kind um, of plot the. Yeah, no, it, lo it looks good. Uh, I'm glad that we remapped it. Because um, I think the last one was like 2014, 2015. So, I mean, geologically, the, that's that's a snapshot. But, you know, it's good to at least get the. Yeah. Uh, a little higher res, I think, w for our sonar. Right. Um, yeah, the idea is. Um, we're just going to try to go on the quicker side for these these lower or the deeper depth spots initially um, so that we have time at the end of the dive up in the caldera. Um, but yeah, no, it looks like you have a solid plan going. Yep, we'll slow things down, about a rock every 10 meters. <laughs> yep, no. <Ooh. laughs> no, Hannah. <laughs> I'd be happy. Her I am already happy though. Herc won't be able to get off the seabed. Yeah. <laughs> H 
Hannah, I think I heard you say earlier that you're expecting to see some pumice down here. Well, I was or reading, and it said there there may be pumice. Oh. So there's pumice generated by these sorts of eruptions, but it actually may have Not all come from all, this, yeah. They may have all floated away. It yeah. may be the least likely to find it here, given that it wouldn't be wouldn't have soaked up any water yet. Yeah, just some um, I'm just imagining though, since we're by so much. Yeah, 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 for sure. But and yeah, any pumice we see, we can't assume yes. is from this count, yes. this uh, seamount. Correct. Because that stuff moves, as we've seen. Yes. Yeah, no, this seamount is hypothesized to be part of my, well, the seamount chain that I study, the Voyager seamounts, which are right oh. there. That's mine. Well, not mine. I keep saying mine, but <laughs> she like keeps saying I, I, I know they're not mine, but <laughs> they're <laughs> that the ones that I study, they're right here, and so mine, the one we're at, is above it, and so this is supposed hypothesized to be part of the same hot spot. She's like, I have a deed for these. Are these also Cretaceous, like the other seamounts we've been looking at? Hopefully. Hopefully it originated in Cretaceous. But, but these are, yes. Yes. Right? Yeah. So far. Like 80 million years ago? So far, around so. that age. <laughs> so far. Waiting on further testing. Yes, waiting on more results. I think this is a cool feature, like the channel between the islands there. I Okay, so I think these, these um, elongated. Ridge. No, I know, but they're, they're they're called VERs. I need to remember what it stands for. What was the acronym? VER? VER. VER? Yes. V is in Victor. Yes. I forgot. Vertical extension ridges? It's something ridges. Oh, well, that's that sounds that's a pretty good guess. <laughs> <laughs> it could be that. For some reason my mind went to venerated, which is probably not <laughs> what it is. I'm going to I'm going to look it up. Volcanic could be volcanic. No, hold up. That's a good B word for this sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, volcanic extension ridges. That, that sounds. That I think that's it. I'm gonna look at. I have it written. I have it written down. I think that is. I think it's. That makes sense. I think it's that volcanic extension. My earth science minor coming in clutch. <laughs> clutch. Yeah, I think so. Sebastian, what are you It's like we're looking at seamounts. What could V possibly stand for? <laughs> <laughs> you know? Um. It's clearly Virgo. <laughs> clearly. Please. Sebastian, when are you expecting to finish? You're doing your undergrad, right? I finished this semester. Nice. Oh, that's cool. Yes. Literally just taking my capstone right now, which is the reason I'm able to still be here on the Nautilus while taking courses. Awesome. Mm. Yeah, that's good timing. Well, early congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. congratulations. Yes. Vir virtual lay from your uh, shipmates. Thank you. I had a, uh, a video engineering intern from uh, University of Rhode Island, I think, come out several years ago. And when I offered her a choice of legs, one of them was more attractive than others. But it meant that she would miss her college graduation. Oof. And she decided to do that. She really wanted that opportunity and came out. So we had a graduation ceremony for her on the day of her college graduation in the lounge. Oh, oh that's very sweet. Uh, that's cool. And the keynote speaker was Steve Jobs. Oh. We well, replayed Derek, we his uh, right Stanford address. Contour? Can't get Bob on the phone? <laughs> I, uh, I skipped both my undergrad and master's graduations for fieldwork in Belize. Um, but then Bob did actually hood me for PhD, so that was cool. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. So I, I, would, I had to go for that. that way. I, I would have made the exact one. same decision. I, did that. <laughs> I can't believe I did it. Oh, I was close. Volcanic, Volcanic elongated, elongated ridges. Elongated ridges. Yes. Okay, I got elongated ridges right. I don't know why. I. You know what? I'm going to blame it on it being 5.30 a.m. Would you like to continue your thoughts? Or where we got? Well, oh, yeah. So we're still trying to figure out why that happens. Yeah. Why these lines occur. 
Is it possible for those main yeah, island chains, they were former Hawaiian Sorry. islands or seamount, then they often have um, deep sea landslides that form those ridges mm. on the main islands. I, um, I, I think these are too uh, prominent. Too prominent? Yeah, I don't think this would just come from... Do you think it could I be... I see what you're talking about right here, though. Yeah. But not... Not for is it possible that they are those, but with erosional pressures getting rid of the other feature? Four beams, good Doppler. I guess. 90 could, meters off bottom. I, I, I can't prove or disprove that. I know it's conjecture, but it's just like, is it? Do you think it's feasible? We're coming up on the seafloor, so we're going to need the air so we can get situated here and uh, get everything fair, set up, fair. and then we'll get on with the dive. So. One of my Hold on, guys. Sorry, what was that, Ed? Uh, we're, we're coming up, up on the seafloor, so we need the uh, air to uh, the just clear the comms so we can get set up here, and then we'll get on with the dive. Well, Sounds good. A pretty steady altimeter hit. Looks like 2280. All right. And I've got 50 meters to go. This is at 40 meters. Roger. Air upslope from Hercules, I believe. I'm seeing some hits on my sonar. Yep. You can call us up at 30 meters out to see if you know. Roger that. I'll yeah. stop at 30 meters off. The bottom and the down with the camera. There it is. Starting to get in choose two bottom in sight, RV on bottom. meters off the altitude too. Okay. Yep. What 
looks like closest contact is about due north. Yep. Good to descend down and to bottom. Follow me down. Do some white balance. Yep. Setting up for weight balance, Ed. Aye. Getting on comms to the arm. There you go. You can shoulder it out a little more. There you go. Let's try that. Ready? Coming in. Coming in. All right. Maybe a slight bump up. That's right, close. Can you give me a little tilt up? That's great, thanks. All right, going to go ahead and black balance the camera. It's going to take the camera right. dark. It is intentional. It's going to take about six seconds starting now. Well, it's pretty good to start with, actually. That's a little better. Okay. Good black balance. White balancing now. Oh, that was way off. Great. Saving that. And coming out. Good white balance. Video is good. Quick health check over here. Great. All right, Derek, what are we thinking for?
go. Direction. Do north. Yeah, let's do uh three five five. Three five five. You guys all set? Yeah, to move? We're all set. I'll go to video. Start off at like 0 0.2 knots. Yeah, to the beep. Yep. Bridge nav. Can we please track a line bearing 355 at 0 0.2 knots? Thank you. Looks like we're set up nicely. We're kind mm -hmm. of in a flat spot at the base of this uh, slope. So we'll be heading up slope. Yeah, I think once we get moving, we'll see what the slope is like. Um, but we do want to try to make uh, decent headway on these early, deeper waypoints. And we would like to collect a rock since we did just touch down if possible. Yes. We do? Yes, we do. We, okay. we will need a rock. I well, recommend maybe forward. I'm ready seeing that there's some sediment spots. Yes, because, well, maybe, should we, Val wants us to try along a ridge. Not yeah, I don't think, I don't think now's a good spot. All right, no. sounds good. But thank you, Sebastian. Aww. Mom, thanks for all the pictures of the animals. <laughs> They're so cute. I miss them so much. Oh, and thank you, Miss Chantal. Einstein looks so cute. <laughs> so Hannah, I'm seeing very light sedimentation. Is this indicative of a younger flow? I have no idea. It's I don't, I don't kind think of hard to tell. Yeah, I don't think the sedimentation is any less than we've seen on other well, volcanic flows. At least when we first touched down, it looked like it. Well. The last one was in that, well, not the last one, but one, you know, this is a different, we're on a, actually on the slope here. We're not on the seat, on the base of the seabed. Um, so this isn't like when we were in the submarine canyon where we came down on the sedimented area. Oh. Uh, I know, but at the same time, it, they, they are pillow basalts and they do have crevices and a lot of those crevices did not have sediment when you first touched down. Yeah, I think it's really hard to tell because I bet if we could, <laughs> it would be to our advantage of um, trying to determine these ages. Okay. Is that a fish? Where? Looks like it. I see a fish, oh, yes, fish. on the left. First fish of the day. Oops, fast. Mm -hmm. 
right at the laser beam. We able to get a zoom, or do you think he's gonna be too zoomy? Uh, not yet. Still just waiting on the ship to move. It's too far out. No worries. Visibility is good, though. Yeah, very light rain snow. Have to pick it up to point three if you want. Oh, I think point two is fine. Point two is okay. Yeah, it's just waiting on that move to start. I don't know. I didn't feel it. Yep. Are you tracking the line or is it just tracking a, a line? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, that'll be that'll be good. Just to pull around here. We'll wait. That's kind of cool looking. Yeah. Nice erosional features. What's going on with that crack? Wow, that's cool. Yeah. Wow. Look at this. That looks like Antelope Canyon in <laughs> Arizona. Yeah, a little slot canyon. Yeah. I was just there last year. Well, there is the current that comes through there. Maybe it comes through there, but I'm assuming if it's front and back, that it does. Another fish. Looks like an eel. This looks like, again, like multiple lava flows on top of each other. Oh, and look. Puhe. Puhe? Puhi? Puhi. Puhi. Looks similar species to what we saw earlier by those bamboo, high density bamboos in the last sea mount. Whoa. We've got so many viewers joining us this morning, all over the world, exploring with us right now. Let's go for a quick zoom here. Right. Yep, looks like the same species for sure. And if you're just joining us, we just get. started this dive. I yeah. mean, in terms of landing on the bottom, uh, just like five minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Look laser shot. And we're at a depth of about 2,290 meters. Yeah, this is going to be a really exciting dive. Um, it's going to last 24 hours, and Can we, we get are... a zoom on the orange on the rock, please? It's oh, the first oh. coral. It was right behind the circle I just drew. Sorry. Looks pretty sparse, so I just try to get my zooms where I can since we're gonna be moving fast. Is that a black coral? I'm leaning black coral, but I'm waiting for the zoom. I think I see the Yeah, I'm leaning black coral. Yeah. All right. Thank you. So yeah, we've just started this 24-hour dive on an unnamed seamount that has not been explored yet. It was first mapped in 2014 by RV Falcor, and we're going to be spending some time down here. And I'm really excited for this one. We are currently traveling up a ridge located on the western side, and we're going to end up in a caldera. So we're hoping There's to see in the crevice. a lot of awesome geology, which I feel like we're already seeing like so many interesting things. Yes, and then a lot of biology, and we are currently within Papa Hanau Mokuakea Marine National Monument, and this is Expedition NA-154, Ala Au Moana Kaiuli, the path of the deep sea traveler. And after this dive, we actually only have one more before the next leg starts, so this is going to be a good one. I'm excited. I'm already loving the geology of this one. I know. Already. Even though I was already kind of excited when I saw that it was a caldera, but yeah. even more now after looking at the rocks. <laughs> wow, these look like real pull lavas. 
Like they don't look like rock fragments like we've been seeing. Yeah, I would agree. These look like pillow lavas. The, the first ones that we saw on the way down were for sure pillow lavas as well. And this that looks like... Had that sort of bulgy look. A mixture between low bait flow and pillow lava. Yeah, it looks like they, it was like right on the edge. Mm -hmm. Some of them Which like pillowed out and some of them were like, yeah. oh, I'm still a low bait. Walteria. So again, just going over the three different types of lava flows that occur on a seamount is dependent on their velocity and the fastest is sheet, sheet flow, then low bait flow, which is what we're looking at right now, and pillow lavas, which is the slowest velocity. Didn't we just say these look like pillows though? It, they, it, so it's like a mixture, because there are some pillows in there, but it all, also, it, this is looking like low bait flow, whereas like these, I can't tell if they're attached or not. Yeah, the, the blockier stuff that we saw when we first touched down, that was much more pillow. Where it's all interconnected like this is more low bait. But it, it seems like it was almost, like Mike was saying, it was almost a pillow, but just not quite there yet. Because I believe if we try to grab like any of these, it's just going to be, it's going to be stuck. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so we're just getting to sort of a transition between a flatter area and the, the beginning of a slope we're about to move up. Yep, sounds good. Yeah, so it's interesting in this, in this region that we've been exploring, um, a lot of the mapped areas have been done by Nautilus, by NOAA ship Okeanos Explorer, and by the Schmidt Ocean Institute's Falcor, um, among other research vessels that come through. But um, those are kind of a lot of the data is those three exploration vessels. So it's, those are our close partners, and we. Um, kind of build on each other's um, coverage of the area. When we come through, we look at what's been mapped so far and try to build on um, on those maps, not reduplicate. We did just do one little line over the seamount this morning just to make sure that we had the highest resolution data we could to, um, to, to use that for today's dive. Um, so right now we have like a 50 meter resolution map that we're using to navigate up this slope and up the ridge today. And Derek, when we're talking about this 50 meter resolution map, what does that number 50 meters tell us about this map? Like, is that how detailed it is? Or? So it's basically, um, it's, you could think of it like the resolution of a picture, sort of, like with mm -hmm. cameras, with digital cameras. So um, the, all the, the mapping work that we did, um, each each kind of cell in our map is, is uh, there's w one depth sounding per 50 meters, basically. It's been averaged to that. Um, so you can't resolve features smaller than, than that um, in, the, in the map. And then from that, we derive contour lines, just like you would on a topographic map. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of a simplified um, way of looking at the terrain, and it helps you sort of understand the trends and the, the topography. Um, I think that's Militaris. Uh, the coral over there. Yeah, it's Militaris. Also, I think where you have waypoint 1.5 would be a good place to start looking for a rock. Yeah, that sounds can. good. Okay. Up slope about 50 meters. That's perfect. Thank you. Sure. Nice. And thanks, Derek, for that explanation. You know, learning about all the maps and how they're created has been one of my favorite parts about this experience. Because that was something I didn't know a lot about at all before I started. Yeah, so I mean, just a general rule about sort of ocean mapping. I mean, the closer you are to the seafloor when you map it with your sensors, the, with your sonar, 
usually the higher resolution maps you can make. So we do have an, on an upcoming cruise this season, we're going to mount a multi-beam actually on the ROV, most likely. And, wow. you know, so if you're mapping from just a few meters off, we can make centimeter resolution maps of this area. Wow. Whereas, you know, this morning we were mapping from the ship, which is uh, 2,300 meters away, you know, at the surface. So you can kind of imagine that you can't map these features in very fine detail that far away. So that's why we can build about a 50 meter resolution map. Um, yeah, on our RV, centimeter scale maps are possible. And there's sort of intermediate technology where you can fly like an autonomous underwater vehicle, which looks like a big torpedo usually. And you can mount side scan sonars or multi beam sonars off of those and get, um, you know, uh, sort of medium resolution, I guess you'd say, mm -hmm. depending on how close you fly it to the seafloor. Isn't uh, the AUV Sentry coming out in a couple legs, or is that next year, maybe? I think that's next year. Yeah, I think that's oh. next year. Okay. That's always... Uh, I just read it's on Atlantis right now. Ah, uh, okay. Oh, no kidding. That's such a great utility vehicle. So, Derek, one of the um, important things we try to do at Papa Hanau Mokuakea is to create like career pathways for youth. Are there certain, in your position that you have, are there certain like words of advice of, of what to focus on for anybody who's listening um, who could potentially be thinking of this as a career? Like ocean mapping specifically? Um, yeah, yeah, what you do currently. Yeah, I think um, basically you want to get a strong foundation in science and math. Um, and the physical sciences for um, and for ocean mapping specifically. Um, so kind of at the high school level, definitely taking you know that strong track in consistent um, science and math classes would be really helpful. Um, also, if you have the opportunity to take classes in earth science, um, geology, geography, um, those are all really helpful. When you get more to um, like beyond high school, if you could take any coursework in um, kind of continuing that thread, physics is really helpful. Um, and I talked a little bit yesterday if you uh, about geographic information bit. systems. Uh -huh. So that's basically uh, computer mapping software that uh, mm -hmm. also has databases connected with it. So you can track a lot of detailed information about um, whatever you're mapping. Um, so it's basically just tying maps together with a way to track lots of detailed information um, and, and use sort of spatial analytical yeah, tools yeah. Um, to answer questions and, okay. and store data. Um, so GIS is a really interesting field to, to learn like more about pillow. and I encourage people to go, ch go look at some of the resources online about what, what oh. is geographic information systems. Cool, so awesome. If you love maps and you love working with data sets, it's like a nice playground. <laughs> um, so a common, there's a lot of, uh, there's so there's free coral. GIS software and there's also software that um, typically buy at the professional level and then, um, but most schools have academic like uh, learning educational licenses. So it'd be typically kind of free to students to learn something like a, a GIS and different software packages. Awesome. Mahalo for sharing that because I know um, like only like what is it 20% of the 